Well, hi. Today, you and I are gonna have a little chat about NFTs, and I'm going to try and keep this chat a little one because this shit gets boring really fast and I have a habit of going off on tangents. So really fast, I'm going to assume that the extent of your knowledge about the crypto world is that you've heard a bit about Bitcoin and everything else is confusing. The reason I'm assuming that is because that's where the vast majority of people are and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. However, in recent months, you may have heard a lot of opinions or news about NFTs. NFT music is going to shake up the music industry industry. It is going to take the power away from the record labels and put the power back into the hands of the musicians. NFTs are going to be the most consequential change in music since streaming music and iTunes before that. So a lot of you clicked on this link and are still thinking, what the fuck is an NFT? Well, it's a non-fungible token. The word fungible is totally unnecessary for something that you expect to have mass adoption. They could have been called unique digital tokens or unforgeable intangible tokens or just digital autographs. But this is the financial world where everything is intentionally made more complicated so it seems more respectable. Fungible is like the opposite of unique. Water is fungible. And I'm gonna pour myself a glass of it here. And you see this glass of water and you say, Ben, that is the most beautiful glass of water I've ever seen. And I say, well, thank you. You're not the first person to compliment my water pouring skills, but I'm actually not all that thirsty right now, so I'm gonna pour it back. And you're like, wait a minute. I said that was the most beautiful glass of water I've ever seen. I'll give you a million dollars for it. And I say, well, okay, stupid. Here you go. The second glass contains different water from the same jug, and you don't know how little or much of it is the same. The water from this container is just water after all, and there's no way to increase or decrease value between one drop and the next. It's fungible. So non-fungible is the opposite of that. See what I mean? They made it way too fucking complicated. Think of an NFT in its current form as a virtual token that cannot be copied, almost like a Bitcoin with a serial number on it that also has the ability to pay a royalty to its creator every single time that it's traded. A common misconception is that an NFT holds an MP3 file or an image file inside of it. It does not, it links to it externally. So it's more of like a digital certificate that gives you a deed to the creation that it links to except the word deed might be bad because it doesn't actually license you to use the creation outside of what you already could have done had you not bought the NFT. The best metaphor I could think of is if I took one of my old albums and burned it to a CDR and autographed the front of it and sold it to you. This concept or technology is not recognized by copyright law and I highly doubt that it will be anytime in the near future. So if you took this CDR and you sampled one of my songs and made your own song and put it on Spotify, I can still say no and sue you. So whether you think that's a novelty that you would want to personally collect or whether you think it's stupid or whether you think it's something you want to trade, it is a truly unique token that cannot be forged. I created a poll on Twitter asking, do you understand how blockchains work? Like actually, could you explain it to an eight-year-old? And 14% of my followers said yes, 39% said that they get the overall concept, and 48% said no. So if you are in that 87% majority, let's go. Three good friends, Gary, Vanessa, and Linus, decide that they want to move to an island and become self-sustainable. They're going to need some sort of system to trade with each other on this island. However, since they're secluded, it doesn't really make that much sense to pay bank or PayPal fees. So they decide that they're going to have personal paper ledgers instead. Every single IOU that they give or receive is written down in their personal ledgers. And at the end of every night, they sit around a table and copy each other's transactions so all of their ledgers are identical. No one person owns more than 50% of the ledgers. So as long as everybody keeps updating their ledgers, this trade system is decentralized, secure, and seemingly infallible. This sounds like something that's very self-sustainable, but there is one problem. Paper is finite, and the ledgers will be constantly growing with new transactions. So they decide that if one of them wants to chop down trees to make new paper pages for the ledgers, they will compensate him or her with IOUs. I realize that this metaphor is getting a little bit complicated, so if you haven't figured this out by now, the IOUs are Bitcoins, the ledgers are Bitcoin wallets or nodes, and the people chopping down trees and making new pages for the ledgers, those are miners. So some new people move to this self-sustaining island and have ledgers of their own. A lot of them get to work creating paper simply because it pays more than selling coconuts or whatever they intended on doing otherwise. But as the population increases, we realize that the trees on the island are also finite, and that the incentive to remove them is actually creating an economic problem of its own. Also, since there are now so many transactions happening, updating the ledgers has a growing backlog. Now, buying a coconut takes a few hours of waiting for all the other transactions to be written into the ledgers. This, by the way, is where we're at right now with Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
Now, back in this world, miners are using absurd amounts of energy to give us new blocks of data for the ledger. And since power, time, and hardware always cost money, mining is always hanging on the cusp of being worth it. This means that transactions take much, much longer than anyone could have envisioned back when this all started. One last thing before we head into NFTs. It's important to understand that Bitcoin, Ethereum, and most early blockchains use mining because they're proof of work. This means that they require miners to guess encryption phrases until they unlock the blocks. This is why it uses such an incredibly wasteful amount of energy per transaction. The energy use is so grossly extravagant that the numbers seem hyperbolic. And when doing the research for this video, I repeatedly fact-checked myself because I thought I was understanding it wrong. But I wasn't. For example, just one Bitcoin transaction in 2021 uses as much energy as my entire fucking house did in the last month. Let's put all of this into a personal perspective. You bought insulated glass windows. You paid a few extra grand for an air conditioner with a high sear rating. You replaced all of your lights with LED bulbs. One Bitcoin or Ethereum transaction negates all of that. The Bitcoin blockchain alone uses more energy than Argentina, like the massive country with 41 million people, Argentina. There is no way around this, and it is damning. Crypto traders, NFT marketplaces, and artists who use these particular blockchains are environmentally irresponsible. Period. I've spent the last month buried in the crypto and NFT world, and as a result of that, I have the honor of presenting the best mental gymnastic moves to excuse yourself from criticism for being totally environmentally irresponsible with your art. The whataboutism is back. It suffered a bit of a burnout after half the country ignored the government's actions for years to concentrate on Hillary's emails, but it's raging back in the NFT space. People on Twitter actually let me in on some examples of other things that contribute to carbon emissions. Agriculture, transportation, computing, residential electricity use. Yep, all of those things use energy. Back to blockchains. The most commonly featured whataboutism is a chart comparing crypto's energy use to all of the world's commerce, much of which uses inefficient blockchain technology already, but sure. First of all, how did they calculate the energy usage of trade? Secondly, a fraction of 1% of crypto transactions are for trading outside of the financial world. Meanwhile, over 5 billion people have bank accounts. This would be like me showing you my power meter and being like, Atlanta uses 50 times more power than I do as if me using 2% of the power Atlanta uses wouldn't be a horrifying thing. The choo-choo train argument. If you want a good, unbiased perspective, then what could possibly top an opinionated self-published Medium article by a marketplace that makes millions and millions of dollars off of the technology? They compare the Ethereum blockchain to a choo-choo train. In an article that admittedly initially looks pretty convincing, they say, the train will keep running at the same speed and with the same energy consumption whether or not there are any seats filled. This is total nonsense. If the tube in London didn't have any passengers one day, it would still run. It might even run the next day or a whole week or month without any passengers, but eventually they'd run it less frequently or make the changes needed to get people to ride it again, otherwise it would be financially unsustainable to run. When you pay the high gas fees to mint or create an NFT on the Ethereum blockchain, you are directly paying miners and incentivizing them to buy more GPUs and mining rigs, using more energy. Just because your action doesn't have an instant visible reaction doesn't mean that you're not contributing to the problem. Well, actually, Ethereum 2.0 is going to drop any day now, and it's much better for the environment. Ethereum 2.0 was about to come out any day now since 2017, and right now it doesn't matter anyway because you're doing all of these transactions on the 1.0 blockchain. This is kind of like pretending to care about the Earth and then justifying buying a Ford F450 because solar-powered cars might be a thing in the future. You know, the plan was to move to proof-of-stake before the network was launched. Initially, when so many people are like, no, it's moving to proof of stake, like very, very soon. And I was like, I think I remember hearing that in 2017. Like, I feel like I, yeah, absolutely. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and I was working on it and I stopped working on it. And, you know, uh, a lot, you know, a lot of things have changed and transformed and they actually did release ETH to Beacon Chain, which was a huge, I mean, that is the proof of stake chain. Mm -hmm. It is launched, it's running. Um, but there's no transactions going over that network. But if you're an artist and you're saying, well, how do I participate in this ecosystem? 
let's just go just go to one of these existing proof of stake chains. So why is Ethereum 2.0 being regarded as the solution to all of these problems? It's because it's not using proof of work that requires mining. It's using proof of stake. This is an oversimplification for the purpose of not making this video two hours long, but proof of stake uses other coins on the blockchain network to verify the ledgers instead of solving complex problems. Instead of mining, you could simply opt in to stake your coins and you earn a pretty decent interest rate doing so. I get 4.63% on my Tezos and 4.5% on my Cardano stakes. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, there are plenty of proof of stake blockchains already in existence that are well established and there's no reason to be waiting for Ethereum 2.0. For the purpose of this video, I have created an NFT on a proof of stake blockchain that you could buy with Tezos, which you could buy directly with your credit card from Coinbase. Minting the NFT cost me a fraction of a cent. It happened instantaneously and it took less energy than it would take to flick the flint of this lighter. So why is Aphex Twin releasing NFTs and then promising to plant some trees depending on how much he makes when he could have just minted them elsewhere? If you follow me on Twitter, then you know that I'm pretty pissed off with the amount of peers I have that have large followings that are cashing in on NFTs that could have just easily made one of these larger marketplaces use a different blockchain. These galleries exist solely to make money off of your artwork. The only reason they're running on Ethereum is because y'all are so fucking greedy that you can't wait for one second and say, hey, I wanna contribute to your gallery, but you're using an inefficient blockchain and your choo-choo train argument is fucking stupid, so hit me up when you're ready. This not only benefits the environment, it benefits the artist because you wouldn't have to pay the high Ethereum gas fees. The only reason NFT marketplaces are not doing this is because they're too busy catching all of the money you're throwing at them. Artists, you're the reason I'm making this video. In a decade, the Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchains are going to be about as cool as fracking. Your fans are already begging you to not use this much energy for a token they never asked for and they can't afford. So just wait. Wait, wait one fucking minute. There are already marketplaces using the proof of stake blockchain and some are popping up using coins like Tezos that your fans could buy without ever interacting or touching the Ethereum or Bitcoin blockchains. In a month, there will be half a dozen more. They're in pre-launch as I'm recording this and this will make the more popular galleries follow suit. Even more importantly, NFTs are incentivizing the release of Ethereum 2.0. What was once the crypto version of Half-Life 3 is now an actively developed project with some fire on its ass. Trying to get rid of the miners and the miners are fighting with us about it. And then there's these people who were making millionaires off of nothing. Like I agree, you're selling nothing, but someone yeah. just bought your nothing for a million dollars. I'm facilitating that. Yeah. And you're mad at me about it? More influential people were getting more of this. And they're like, that's it. We're yeah. done. We're going to accelerate the move of, to proof of stake. And now there's this group of miscellaneous artists on the internet who are adding people bitching. And so between those two things, mm -hmm. we're just like, you know, we'll just go to proof of stake then. And, and so I, I, I'm very, so that's why I'm more confident now than ever. This is all legitimately really good news. And if you were patient enough to make it to this segment of the video before minting an NFT on Ethereum, you get to participate in this cool new thing without requiring 50 times more energy than you used to make the artwork connected to it. And you won't have to make up whataboutisms or make promises to plant trees to bullshit your fans with. So now that we're not all blowing smoke out of our asses, we can have an actual conversation about this giant fad of NFTs. And it is a big fad. Everybody has NFT fever. It's everywhere in the news. I pulled my Twitter audience and a whopping 94% of them said that if their favorite artist released an NFT, they would not buy it. That does not sound like a fad at all, does it? So who are these art-loving collectors? The wonderful thing about blockchain is that aforementioned ledger. If somebody had insomnia, let's say, and he was really curious for the purpose of a YouTube video, he could stay up really late one night and thumb through data of artists. And you know, he might find, for example, that the wallet or firm that bought NFT sent and received millions and millions of dollars in transactions in really short bursts of time. Most of those transactions were with other anonymous wallets, and those wallets have purchased ERC-721 tokens from the exact same marketplace. You know, it's almost like NFTs and Ethereum are my clothes and I'm like putting them in the laundry machine and then taking them out without the stink of my activity on them. 
So as usual, the artists who make by far the most money are the ones who are already established and everybody else just jeopardizes their reputation by dumping content into the Ethereum blockchain as if it were a fucking lottery ticket. But the ones really making the most money, as usual, are not even artists. The hype around NFTs comes with some pretty hefty promises. And what about the future? Will NFTs empower artists or provide a solution to the problems that, for example, were highlighted in my Spotify video? I am also not a huge fan of creating artificial scarcity on a resource that isn't finite, like information. It's disingenuous and unsustainable in its current form, and I could go on about how my personal ethics disagree with it, but that's kind of irrelevant for the purpose of this video. That being said, music and blockchain will almost certainly be married together in a much more fruitful and beneficial way in the future. But to those of you who are paying gas fees and minting NFTs on Ethereum, it is not hard at all to calculate the absurd amount of energy that you're wasting, and you need your fans more than they need you. More importantly, if you haven't noticed, the planet you live on is on fire. So for fuck's sake, wait a second, like a month. Look, I have a lot of personal opinions about NFTs, and this video isn't about them. This video is to help you understand what this is and how it all works. And if you want to talk more about my personal opinions, then check out my streams on Thursday evenings and ask me. If you learned anything, or if you like this video, subscribe to my channel. If there's anything you want me to cover in the future, let me know in the comments. All of this is possible thanks to my patrons. You could join us right now and not only support this channel, but get access to an awesome Discord community, a backlog of all of my weekly streams, a bunch of unreleased music, a bunch of game servers, audio production assets, whole bunch more for as little as a dollar. Bye.